The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, where's Waldo? Yikes. Waldo with a Waldo is building Waldos that make Waldos to scratch Waldo where Waldo itches. Flying carpet taxis and good-looking brutes in high heels, plus part two of our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. This time on the podcast, we have an interview with the great fantasy and science fiction author, Tim Powers, on Robert A. Heinlein's Waldo and Magic Incorporated. Tim is one of my all-time favorite writers, the author of such book as The Anubis Gates, Last Call, On Stranger Tides, Hide Me Among the Graves, and many others. He counts Heinlein as a great influence, and now he's written a wonderful afterword to Bain's new edition of Heinlein Classic. And we also continue our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic, as read by Bronson Pincho. That's coming up. But first, Laura Haywood Corey joins me for the news. We have a very amusing contest this month, or maybe very serious, depending on how you look at it. Here's the skinny on it. In one paragraph, tell us the best way aliens bent on human subjugation and conquest could hide among us and attempt to take over the world. Then, in a couple of sentences, suggest the best countermeasure. And what's the prize, Laura? Well, the winner will receive a hardcover edition of the new Crown of Slaves series honorverse novel, Cauldron of Ghost, signed by both David Weber and Derek Clint. Cool. Sound fun? Wackiness counts, but uh, being clever is probably better. And, if you're convincing enough, we may all want to take due action based on your scenario. Indeed we may. Okay, all the details can be found at Bain.com there on the front page. Look over on the right-hand sidebar. Left hand. Left-hand sidebar, and there it is. So, get your conspiracy on and warn us all before it's too late. Editor Emeritus Hank Davis joins us today, and welcome to another of our ongoing Robert A. Heinlein discussions and roundtables. And we're very pleased to welcome Tim Powers to the podcast. Hi, Tim. Hello, people. Tim Powers is a legendary science fiction and fantasy author and a huge influence on yours truly. We published some great fantasy at Bain, but I have to say Tim is my favorite fantasy author still among the living. He's the winner of the Philip K. Dick Award, two, fantasy, two World Fantasy Awards, as well as a host of other impressive hardware. Tim is probably best known for his secret history novels. In these, he brings together historical events and magic or supernatural events in weird and incredibly entertaining ways. These often fe- feature famous people like Last Call's Bugsy Siegel or um, the Rossettis in his latest novel, Hide Me Among the Graves. Tim is also a science fiction writer and who frankly invented steampunk with his novels such as Dinner at Deviant's Palace. But today we're going to talk about a favorite of Tim's, Robert A. Heinlein, and particularly Heinlein's Waldo and Magic Incorporated, now out in trade paperback in a new edition uh, from Bain at Booksellers Everywhere. We have a great new cover by legendary artist Bob Eggleton. Uh, an introduction by William H. Patterson, the man who literally wrote the Heinlein biography, and he's been a, a guest on this podcast before, and an afterward by Tim Powers. Tim, before we dive into discussing these great novellas, let me ask you what I often ask our guest on these Heinlein-oriented podcasts. Where did you first encounter Heinlein, and how has reading Heinlein affected your own work through the years? <clears throat> well, um, I was 11 years old when my mother bought me a copy of Red Planet, and up to that point, I had been reading, I don't know, Albert Pace and Terhune's dog books and some Raphael Sabatini, but Heinlein just polarized me. Uh, I thought, okay, I knew I was waiting for something. I didn't know what it was, but this is it. Is there more of this? Uh, and so I read all of Heinlein and then discovered there were other people that did this sort of thing as well. And so for about 10 years, all I read was 
science fiction and fantasy, and Heinlein has always remained a prominent favorite. I think a year doesn't go by that I don't reread, I don't know, eight or ten of them. And I think, I think if I had to look in my own work for influence of Heinlein, it would be keep it firmly bolted to the real tangible, a real tangible world. Keep in mind all the mundane hardware, nuts and bolts, uh, details at the same time that you're showing the reader vast, you know, uh, mind-stretching concepts. In Heinlein, you're always, in any scene, you could stop and draw the surroundings, and it would be the same as any reader would do. Uh, he makes it so clear that you you really experience the surroundings vicariously. And I think, I hope, that I've taken that from him. As with many things, that was kind of a turning point in science fiction. He sort of got the ball rolling right before the war on this sort of realistic brand of science fiction that has um, become something that we just expect now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he the Science fiction gets more than its share of people who really arrive there by some random chance, like Heinlein really intended to go into a career uh, in the military, I believe. Yeah, the Navy. Um, but illness popped him out of that, and he wound up bringing the perspectives and expertises and attitudes, kind of practical, pragmatic attitudes, by default to our field to the enormous benefit of our field. Yeah, he uh you you can see a dramatic change in all of the writers once Heinlein came along. People talk about of course Campbell as the big watershed uh figure in the field, but arguably Campbell was that because he found Heinlein. Now, you say Red Planet was your first encounter. Now, that's got the Martians, right, in it, the, from... Um, little uh, the Willis, would, the little spherical guy. Yeah, who would later, and those Martians would later appear in, uh, it's the same Martians as Stranger in a Strange Land, I, I think. It does seem to be, yeah. yeah. That, but that sort of weird, uh, that sort of alien weirdness there, um, it really it, it strikes me as sort of a Tim Powers kind of thing as well. Just uh, an oddness beyond just the the science being Came weird. A Tim Powers thing at second hand. <laughs> yeah, that Heinlein wasn't the first, uh, but he was maybe the most effective up to that time at making aliens genuinely alien. The Martians in, for example, Red Planet, you can communicate with them, but you'll never understand the way they think. And their motives will be comprehensible only by kind of an analogy with human emotions. And uh, that was a big improvement on the sort of aliens that science fiction had generally had in the 30s, which uh, they wanted gold or earth women or something like that. Hank, did you want to get in a uh, red yeah. planet? Uh, well, the, one interesting thing about Red Planet, you don't come across many uh, YA novels or juveniles, as they were called then, from the 50s, that uh, where the aliens may or may not be a ghost, although the the uh, the humans don't realize that at first. True. Um, you could say that Heinlein, from very early on, was almost unwittingly bringing in mystical elements to his science fiction almost as if the mystical elements are an intrinsic part of the extrapolative science. Um, certainly in Waldo and Magic, for example, those two stories, they're very almost hard-boiled, 
almost uh, journalistic style, but certainly there are mystical elements in them. Yeah, well, let's talk about those. As you point out in your afterword to Waldo and Magic Incorporated, uh, both both of these novellas were published about about the same time, I believe, in magazines edited by Campbell, uh, Astounding and Unknown. Now, you say that either of these stories could have been published in the other magazine in your afterwards. What do you mean by that, Tim? Well, really, Waldo is an overtly, ostensibly science fiction novella, obviously, with orbital uh, environments and whatnot, but it quickly becomes a pretty unarguably fantasy story with the introduction of Grant Schneider and his uh, what you'd have to call magic uh, and Magic Incorporated which was published in Unknown does deal with you know magic flying carpets uh, all kinds of supernatural creatures but Heinlein handles it as if it was an advanced technology with uh, traffic rules for flying carpets and agencies you can go to to get relief from uh, some sort of uh, salamanders or something that are burning your property and <laughs> attorneys you can consult to uh, lift a curse, uh, menus in restaurants that uh, have imaginary food you can order which you can eat but which won't give you any calories. And so, although the story was about what you would have to call magic, it was handled as if as if it was technology. It was handled the way a science fiction story would be written. So with those two stories, he really did straddle the line dividing science fiction and, uh, from fantasy. Uh, although Waldo was published before two years before I was born, uh, I was a big magazine collector back in the 60s, and I, I, had, I, I read a lot of the astoundings from the 40s, and I, I remember one or two readers writing in later and complaining that Waldo was fantasy, it should be an astounding. So, <laughs> so there, there was a little discontent, but I think most people, most of the letters said, wow, what a great story. Yeah, uh, Campbell, especially once he started Unknown, really did, uh, I mean, I think most astounding readers read Unknown and vice versa. Uh -huh. He did manage to push the two branches of the genre effectively closer together. Yeah. Also, also people may not be aware who haven't actually read Unknown that the, uh, there was a lot of science fiction in Unknown. The very first issue started off with Eric Frank Russell's right, Sinister, Sinister Barrier, Barrier, which is science fiction, not fantasy, as far as I'm concerned. True. Great story, too. Yeah, and other stuff, like uh, uh, there was a science fiction story by Sturgeon that for some reason was in Unknown. And yeah, uh, what, It, or? The, I think it was called The Golden Egg, but I need to check that. Yeah. 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 Oh, you're right. Yeah, I think of it as science fiction rather than fantasy. Although it's a horror story, which may have been why he didn't have it in unknown. And certainly, all his writers jump back and forth with no hesitation. Yeah, and and, and another major work, uh, El Spring to Camp's Less Darkness Fall. As far as I'm concerned, yeah. that's science fiction, but it was in unknown. It was the lead novel in unknown. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those are. Ter uh, really was a tremendous period from about, what, 39 through about 45. Yeah, well, Unknown folded at 43. Uh -huh. Oh, fact, I, true, yeah. I, I've seen the last issue, and they didn't expect it to be the last issue because they announced that uh, the next issue would be digest size instead of pulp size. Uh -huh. But instead, it never appeared. Well, that was a victim of World War Two. Yeah, paper shortage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do have a complete set of unknown. Ah. <laughs> you hat, and Hank. My hat's off to you, sir. Do you think he was kind of straining toward, uh, seems like he wanted to write a philosophical story with the, with both of these, um, that turns on, uh, more a philosophical point than a science or even magic point. 
Uh, yeah, definitely, um, especially in Waldo, because he posits that the quantum uncertainty has been disproved and that the universe is, after all, deterministic Newtonian clockwork. And Waldo manages, with the help of the sort of bucolic Gramps Schneider, to reintroduce uh, quantum weirdness, uh, uncertainty, back into the picture, and he makes the point that without that, without uh, reintroducing or re-recognizing the loopholes in Newtonian mechanics, then every symphony was written by the action of molecules and colloids. Uh, and I suppose ultimately you'd have to say the Big Bang mm-hmm. wrote Shakespeare's plays and, uh, and, and, and Beethoven's symphonies. So yeah, that is a philosophical point. Yeah. Uh, you know, free will versus determinism. Uh, is there really any plain physical excuse for us to imagine that we do have free will? Really a very heavy point to, um, be introduced so lucidly in a pulp magazine in 1942. Yeah, and he um, he comes down pretty heavily on the we are free side. I think there's no yes. doubt of that. <laughs> so in Waldo, uh, just for those who aren't familiar with the story, we have Waldo Jones, uh, a guy born with a degenerative nerve disease and a genius mind, or maybe not. Um, as Heinlein has Dr. Grimes say, Waldo just figured out how to use that other 90% of his brain. Well, that's the way Heinlein put it elsewhere. So he's invented human control manacle manipulators called Waldos, which we have real in reality now, and they're called that. He made his fortune to move to a personal space station that he called Freehold. And uh, it, now humanity needs him to solve a problem that um, they can't seem to find, get their scientific minds around. Tim, up, up in Freehold was... Waldo really free, has he freed himself from his own troublesome, uh, uh, you know, degenerative Um, nerve disease humanity? I would say, I would say yes, he has, but there's a cost in his freehold retreat, his hermitage. He's, he's definitely living in that Newtonian deterministic happily living in it, um, world, and it's not until he is uh, lured out of it to solve the problems that that I think he does fall back into his troublesome humanity and, and free will and, uh, you know, random chance, and I do think it's easy to see it as... <laughs> liberating but in in a, in the same sense um kind of a fall for him because he was master of all he surveyed really as the the strange wizard living in the orbital colony there uh in his little orbital retreat and when he breaks out of that and you could say becomes fully human, I saw it as kind of a fall. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that in your afterward. You, uh, you're you not particularly, um, you, you think it's bittersweet, the ending there. Yeah. You compared it to Flowers for Algernon's ending. Yeah, the, the, the last line of Waldo, the last paragraph is like, oh, it was such a joy to be a dancer and... All the reporters were such great guys, every one of them, and uh, he's signing legal documents without reading them just because everybody's so wonderful. And the last line, I think, is, they were all such great guys, which we, the readers, know is almost certainly not the case. And it does sound like the penultimate line of Flowers for Algernon, uh, I'm going to have a lot of friends where I go. Or even, as I pointed out in the afterward, the last line of 1984, he loved Big Brother. 
and I think it's hard to avoid that sort of reading of it because when he says the reporters and photographers, they're all such great guys, such swell fellows, we instantly think, well, no, that that's not possible. You're deluded. In a way, his uh, return to humanity, if he ever had been there before, his his becoming human is a kind of fall from his mechanistic perfection, satisfactions, uh, dominance. Yeah, that cool. Uh, he's, he's got it. He's got it nice up in his space station, set up for himself. Yeah. He's even got a dog buddy. Yeah, his his life in the space station was it was was perfect for him, and he was he was shrewd and mistrustful and suspicious and demanding evidence as opposed to after he joins the human race at which point he becomes it seems naively trusting now it seems like we sucked him in used him and then crumpled him up <laughs> and threw him away there at the yeah, end yeah he's happy uh at the end and certainly I, I, maybe the moral is we need free will, but it's not really ultimately good for us. <laughs> if we all become creative dancers, you may be right. Yeah, I've always I've always thought God was a little over optimistic in giving us free will. <laughs> well, you mentioned we were talking about the space station. There's so much in Waldo that seems to have walked out of the story and in, into our own reality. There's the weightless space station, the way it's arranged. It seems like just like. The International Space Station is arranged. You got cell phones, atomic power. He, he wrote this in 1942, right? Right, yeah. Though I think Heinlein would be the first to point out that that's not really the job of science fiction, but he did wind up predicting any number of things in there. He predicted that uh, atomic power would be considered as a weapon initially, but then as a real valuable power source, and he even predicted nanotechnology very lucidly, very uh, very clearly. There yeah, you're right. That Waldo invented his little robots to make smaller ones, which would make still smaller ones, and ultimately it would result in robots too small to be seen. And you think, well, okay, that's obviously overtly nanotechnology. Yeah, it seems like, and he perhaps invented this idea of the singularity as well. Maybe that's what yeah. kind of drives Waldo over the edge. Yeah. Because he's been in touch with this other, higher, somewhat other reality. Yeah, which is the sort of yeast, leaven, necessary to add to the plain Newtonian, uh, Laplacean, Determinism, which, yeah, in 1942, that was, uh, physicists were talking that way, but I don't know if it had really been enacted in fiction before. Well, let's, um, let's turn to Magic Incorporated for a moment. Here's an almost equal and opposite reaction to Waldo. It, it's not a surprise to me that these books have been uh, grouped together from the beginning. Hank, did Heinlein want them to group that way? Do you? Bill, Bill Patterson in the introduction says that Doubleday wanted something from Heinlein, and Heinlein tried several different proposals on them, and the one they liked was combining Waldo and Magic Incorporated. So it, it might be considered uh, Edward P. Bradbury, who was his editor at the time at Doubleday, it might be considered his idea that they should have been grouped together they, I think they do go well together. As as an example of how paperback publishers love to change titles, I think the first paperback edition was from Avon in the late fifties, and they retitled it Waldo Colon, Genius in Orbit, which left uh, Magic Incorporated out of the picture. Uh, at that might be because the uh, the editor at Avon or his higher ups thought that the word magic wouldn't sell at the time. Let's see. I think I've got. What was your original question? Sorry. 
Whether Heinlein actually wanted Waldo and Magic oh. Incorporated together. Oh, apparently, but, uh, uh, if if Patterson is correct, apparently it was Edward P. Bradbury's idea. Ah. So, in Magic Incorporated, Archie Fraser or Fraser takes on the this magically powered mob and uh, a monopoly of magic users to save his hardware and construction business. And this eventually takes him into the magical other world. Does it? And you comment in your afterward, and I, does this kind of um, rationalization of magic, where everything works uh, according to logical rules of the magic, um, does it take the magic out of magic? Well, I think that's I think that's always a risk when you write a story in which uh, magic is a you could say routine part of the ordinary world, where you do hire an attorney to get rid of a curse, where there's werewolf warnings on the evening news. The risk is that you take what traditionally has been a kind of big, scary, mysterious, numinous quantity and and mundaneize it to make the vampire the equivalent of of an ordinary serial killer. And the result can be interesting. I think there's a lot of that published these days. A private detective who is hired by a werewolf. It it can make for an interesting story, but I think the the risk, which often happens, is that it does mundaneize it, and you lose the shiver that readers got when they read about Dracula crawling head downward down the wall of his castle, for example, or the effects you get from Lovecraft when somebody picks up a copy of the Necronomicon. I think Heinlein managed to do both. I think he managed to give us a world in which the magic was as routine as electricity. But by taking Fraser into that other world, I think he managed to get the numinous effects too because that other world is described in really evocative weird mysterious ways where there's no up or down and directions on a map might consist of colors and time as much as distance i think in that section heinlein managed to snatch back the big, scary, goosebumps effects that otherwise would would not have been part of the story if he had simply stuck with uh, the action all taking place in that kind of urban diesel and payphones type environment. Yeah. Well, this, like you say, this has become a real familiar thing in science fiction. I think um, there's been some brilliant takes done on it, such as our own uh, Bane's own Larry Correa with his Monster Hunter. Yeah, those stories are a lot of fun. And, uh, I mean, even, say, the Lord Darcy stories. Yeah, that's true. But you, you say that you can't think of a time where before that this sort of magic in combined with the real world has appeared in a story. Do you think Heinlein sort uh, of invented the genre? Yeah, I, I, as, not that I've read everything, but Magic Incorporated is the earliest example I can think of of a world in which uh, magic and supernatural, in fact, you almost want to distinguish between those, um, in which magic effects are an integrated routine aspect of the world. I think to find that before Magic Incorporated, you've got to go all the way back to, I don't know, um, the Arthurian stories, the Thousand and One Nights. In other words, back to stories written during periods when people thought magic really, in fact, was a, a routine part of the world. But in our, in our field, saying it started in roughly 1923 with Weird Tales or or 26 with Amazing Stories, I think Heinlein was the first to do precisely that because in other stories that have magic 
in the real world, such as in the afterward I mentioned, decamps not in the rules. Magic happens in the real world, but people are surprised. They didn't know this could this, this was an option. But in Heinlein and Magic Incorporated, they're not surprised. Oh, damn, you know, salamanders burned down your business? Yeah, that happened to a cousin of mine. We, we should have had insurance for that. We should mention the fact that this is a really humorous story. It's, That's true. It's That's true. almost it is, satire. It is actually very funny. Though he does manage to get some genuinely spooky effects, too. Uh, even in the day-to-day world section of the story, when he describes looking at a salamander, there's a mysterious alien quality that is uh, is a really effectively disorienting trick that that kind of lifts the story out of the you know somebody getting a ticket for going too fast on his flying carpet type of thing. Yeah, but it makes the humor better because it feels real and not just, uh, you know, wisecracks. Exactly. It's It's not a make-believe story. Yeah. Well, there's also a long section in Magic Incorporated that's this all about this um, political machinations to get a bill passed in the state Senate. I I read Bill Patterson's biography and, and know a little about Heinlein's early years. I can't help but see this as a satire of, of the politicians he has known. Yeah, yeah. And since Heinlein did have experience, real hands-on experience with uh, politics, the satire seems to be only a degree or two exaggerated from real life. <laughs> Though it is insane, they introduce a bill on a Saturday evening and officially it was introduced the previous Thursday, and they all, the whole uh, assembly votes to pass a bill in order that they may unanimously drop it later. And, yep. uh, yeah, it's it's satire in that we're shown that these are irrational activities, but at the same time, they're very plausible. <laughs> yeah, you think? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think they do that. And it's um, it, it kind of has its own rules of you know you can something becomes true if you believe it's true in the same way that the magical universe does. Good point. Good point. If you declare it, it, it becomes uh, actuality, and it's a beautiful other half to the 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 magical stuff going on because it's sort of makes the marriage of the mundane world we know and the magical world that ostensibly is is alien and and out of fairy tales, it makes them join more plausibly because he shows us that state legislature, which of course is part of the our mundane world, in fact is as crazy and fantastical as the Hell. <laughs> Berkeley magical stuff I'm yeah. introducing to the story. They're not as incompatible as you might initially have thought. And Waldo has this idea that it's sort of the Bishop Barclay idea of reality where the material world is created by somebody's belief in it. And if you just believe hard enough somehow, you can change scientific principles. And... Yeah. Uh, and of course, that's. A stretch, but not uh, like using the legislature as, as satire. Uh, it's not that extreme a stretch because um, by 1942, physicists were aware that if you, for example, measure light as particles, it'll prove to be particles. If you measure it as waves, it'll cooperatively shift over and manifest itself as waves. And Schrodinger's cat, is he alive or dead? Uh, until you look, he's, he's a waveform, which includes both alive and dead. It's not really all that extreme for Heinlein to say that human participation 
changes the state of the thing you're looking at. Looking at it is going to make it different from what it was before you looked at it. Yeah, this is the new science. In 1942, it's really new. Um, it's amazing he knew about it. But that's the sort of thing it says. And he's extrapolating. I think probably a lot of present-day physicists found, you know, the weird conclusions of people like Niels Bohr uh, more palatable because they had been kind of prepped for it by Heinlein. Yeah, good point. I mean, Heinlein influenced our modern world in, in many, many ways because people like you and all the guys that uh, were in mission control in NASA and, and all the other engineers read him when they were kids. Yeah, and I hope Heinlein uh, is still widely read. Well, we're trying to make sure that's, that happens. We've been reissuing everything we can get our hands on with these great new Eggleton covers. Because... I don't think you get, I don't think you can safely say, oh, well, no, I don't read Heinlein. Uh, anything of value that he had, I'm sure, has been picked up by more recent writers who I do read. I, I, I would say, no, you're, you're missing the bits that you would have picked up. You're, you're benefiting only from the, cool effects that appealed to, happened to appeal to, these newer writers go to the source. Yeah, and there's just a thin veneer of old-fashionedness that uh, is is there, but underneath, this guy's as modern as we are now, and it feels uh, like reading. A... Uh, I I find uh, when I constantly reread books like Have Space It Will Travel or The Star Beast or Citizen of the Galaxy or Between Planets, I find them totally compelling. I mean, I don't mean to reread them all the time. It's just I'll idly pick one up and read the first page, and bang, I've committed to reading the whole book. And as you say, there's a veneer. Maybe the first chapter of uh, Have Space, We Will Travel looks a little 1950s, but, I mean, good Lord, how did, if, if, if that would... De deter somebody, how how on earth are they going to read Mark Twain or Dickens? Absolutely. Um, you could say that Mark Twain has a, a slight veneer of old fashions. I think, it, uh, would you say that Heinlein falls in the same category as um, this is great fiction that's going to stand the test of time, at least in your opinion? Yes. Yes. I don't see books like a double star during the summer, or especially somehow the juveniles, ever going out of print, stopping being read. It's like, I don't know, Lovecraft or, or Raymond Chandler. Both have engendered just hundreds of imitators. And I think the imitators are real susceptible to fading and going out of print as the decades go by. But those sources endure, uh, and certainly I would expect Heinlein to still be in print long after uh, most of us recent people have become kind of footnotes in the John Clute Encyclopedia. Well, the book is an excellent new edition of Waldo and Magic Incorporated by Robert A. Heinlein. It's now out in trade paperback at booksellers everywhere, and it's got Tim Powers' most excellent afterward as a special bonus, all new. Tim's latest novel is Hide Me Among the Graves. Tim, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks. Well, thank you. It's been Thanks, fun. Tim. And now, here is part two of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic, as read by Bronson Pinchot. This portion of Hard Magic is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Here's what has gone before. It's the 1930s in America, but all has been magically changed. Now a handful of people from all walks of life have been given special magical talents, these are called actives. Some use these talents for good, others for self-serving ends, and some use them for murder. Are there any who can stop such twisted power? Well, we're about to meet one such man, Jake Sullivan. 
The only problem is, at the moment, Jake is busy doing time in Rockville Prison, a special penitentiary for actives who have gone wrong. Here is Bronson Pinchot reading part two of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. Billings, Montana Every day was the same. Every prisoner in the special prisoner's wing of the Rockville State Penitentiary had the exact same schedule. You slept. You worked. You got put back in your cage. You slept. You worked. You got put back in your cage. Repeat until time served. Working meant breaking rocks. Normal prisoners were put on work crews to be used by mayors trying to keep budgets low. They got to go outside. The convicts in Special Wing got to break rocks in a giant stone pit. Some of them were even issued tools. The name of the facility was just a coincidence. One particular convict excelled at breaking rocks. He did a good job of it because he did a good job of everything he set his mind to. First he'd been good at war, and now he was good at breaking rocks. It was just his nature. The convict had single-minded determination, and once he got to pushing something, he just couldn't find it in himself to stop. He was as constant as gravity. After a year, he was the finest rock-breaker and mover in the history of Rockville State Penitentiary. Occasionally, some other prisoner would try to start trouble because he thought the convict was making the rest of them look bad. But even in a place dedicated to holding felons who could tap into all manner of magical affinities, most were smart enough not to cross this particular convict. After the first few left in bags, the rest understood that he just wanted to be left alone to do his time. Occasionally some new man, eager to show off his power, would step up and challenge the convict, and he too would leave in a bag. The warden did not blame the convict for the violence. He understood the type of men he had under his care, and knew that the convict was just defending himself. Between helping meet the quota for the gravel quarry that padded the warden's salary under the table— and for ridding the special wing of its most dangerous and troublesome men, the warden took a liking to the convict. He read the convict's records and came to respect the convict as a man for the deeds he'd done before committing his crime. He was the first special prisoner ever granted access to the extremely well-stocked, but very dusty, prison library. So the convict's schedule changed. Sleep, work, read, sleep, work, read. So now the time passed faster. The convict read books by the greatest minds of the day. He read the classics. He began to question his power. Why did his power work the way it did? What separated him from normal men? Why could he do the things he could do? Because of its relation to his own specific gifts, he started with Newton, then Einstein, finally Bohr and Heisenberg, and then every other mind that had pontificated on the science related to his magic. And when he had exhausted the books on science, he turned to the philosopher's musings on the nature of magic and the mystery of where it had suddenly come from and all of its short history. He read Darwin. He read Schumann and Kelzer, Reed and Spengler. When that was done, he read everything that was left. The convict began to experiment with his power. He would sneak bits of rock back into his cell to toy with, reaching deep inside himself, twisting, testing, always pushing with that same dogged determination that had made him the best rock-breaker. And when he got tired of experimenting with rocks, he started to experiment on his own body. Eventually all those hours of testing and introspection enabled him to discover things about magic that very few other people would ever understand. 
but he kept that to himself. Then one day, the warden offered the convict a deal. Chapter One we now have over a thousand confirmed cases of individuals with these so-called magical abilities on the continent alone. The faculty has descended into a terrible uproar over the proper nomenclature for such specimens. All manner of Latin phrases have been bandied about. Professor Girard even suggested grimoire, a combination of the old French grimoire, or book of spells, with noir, for black in the sense of the mysterious, for at this juncture the origin of said powers remains unknown. He was laughed down. Personally, I've taken to calling them wizards, for the very idea of there being actual magic beyond the bounds of science causes my esteemed colleagues to sputter and choke. Dr. L. Fulci, Professor of Natural Science, University of Bern, Personal Journal, 1852. Three Years Later Springfield, Illinois There were twenty local bulls, ten state coppers, and half a dozen agents from the Bureau of Investigation, and every one of them was packing serious heat. Jake Sullivan approved. Purvis wasn't screwing around this time. Delilah Jones was going down. The lead government man was pacing back and forth in front of the crew assembled in the warehouse. You don't hesitate. None of you hesitate even for a second. She's a woman, but don't you dare underestimate her. She's robbed twenty banks in four states and killed five people. He paused long enough to jerk a thumb at his men. When you see her, nobody makes a move until me or Agent Cowley says the word. A second government man raised his hand. Sam Cowley's suit was cheap but his 1928 Thompson was meticulously maintained. Sullivan knew he was a man who kept his priorities in order, so at least he'd been roped into working with an experienced crew this time. There was a wanted poster stuck to the wall. Sullivan had known Delilah back in New Orleans. She was a dish, a real looker. He had to admit that the ink drawing was actually realistic, unlike his old wanted poster where they had uglied him up for dramatic effect. But in the sketch artist's defense, somebody that could crush every bone in your body should look scary. How many men in the gang? One of the locals asked. Melvin Purvis paused. I'm not expecting a gang, just her. The room got quiet. It normally didn't take thirty-seven men with rifles and shotguns to take down a lone woman, bank robber or not. They all realized what that meant about the same time, but nobody wanted to say it. Finally, the same local slowly raised his hand. She got big powers, then? Yes, McKee, she does, Purvis responded. She's a brute, and she's active, probably the toughest I've heard of. McKee lowered his hand. The sea of blue and brown uniforms all looked at each other, grumbling and swearing. Yeah, yeah, I know. Listen, boys, when I got here, I asked you chiefs for hard men. I know you're all up to it, but if any of you want out, there's no shame in leaving. Is that why he's here? McKee asked, since he'd somehow become the leader of the uniforms, gesturing to where Sullivan had been trying to remain unnoticed in the back of the room. He's with me. Purvis said. We let Sullivan do his job, and none of you have to worry about dealing with a little lady who can toss automobiles at you. You got a problem with that? He's a murderer, McKee pointed out. Manslaughter, Sullivan corrected, speaking for the first time. And I done serve my time. J. Edgar Hoover says I'm reformed. There were no more questions forthcoming. Somebody coughed. Purvis folded his arms and waited until the count of ten. Nobody stood up to leave. Good. We try to take her alive. My men go in first with Sullivan. The rest hang back outside and get the bystanders out of the way. Nobody shoots unless she goes active. Then don't miss, Agent Cowley suggested. They'd be moving out in a matter of minutes, and Sullivan sensed the room was nervous. 
kind of bouncy and tense. It reminded him a little of the Great War. In those few awful seconds before the whistle blew and they'd jump out of the relative safety of their muddy trenches and run screaming into Maxim gunfire, barbed wire, and the Kaiser's zombies. Jake Sullivan had gotten the call from Washington two weeks before, telling him to report to Special Agent Melvin Purvis in Chicago. The assignment came at a good time. His regular business as a private dick was floundering, and he had been reduced to pulling the occasional security gig, standing in as muscle during some of the labor strikes. He didn't like it, but just being special didn't pay the bills. At least he hadn't had to hurt anyone. Just his reputation kept the strikers peaceful. Nobody wanted to cross a heavy, especially one that had served time in Rockville. The government jobs barely paid a decent wage, but more importantly, this was the last of the five assignments he had agreed to upon his early release. The warden had appealed to his patriotism when he had transmitted the offer, telling Sullivan that it would be a chance to serve his country again. He had found that amusing, since his only desire at that point was to get out of that hellhole. He'd already served his country once, and had the scars to show for it. As had been agreed upon, every single other magical he had assisted in capturing had been a murderer. Jake still had some principles left. And this one was no different, though he had been surprised to find out that he had known her once. Hearing the name of the target and then the terrible crimes she'd committed had left him stunned. Sullivan still couldn't picture Delilah as a cold-blooded killer, but people could change a lot in six years. He certainly had. That was part two of the complete audiobook serialization of Hard Magic by Larry Correa, read by Bronson Pinchot. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, thanks to Laura Haywood Corey, Christopher Chafani, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a supernatural, multidimensional, phantasmagoric summoning of Philip K. Dick, featuring that author's ghostly head howling thanks, or at least a portion of his torso, and a signed portrait of William Ashbliss singing the long lost words to Box Fugue in D minor to Tim Power, author of Hide Me Among the Graves, for our great Heinlein discussion. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>